and welcome to this fireside chat where we are talking all things funding and finance. I'm joined today by two individuals who played a key role in the 5G New Thinking project to tell us more about this important topic. So let's dive straight in and meet them. First of all, Peter, could you please tell us who you are and what your role in the 5G New Thinking project has been? Absolutely. Uh, hello, Vicky. Um, so, Peter Shebman, I'm uh, the Head of Innovation for Cisco in the UK and Ireland, uh, but more importantly for 5G New Thinking. Uh, I was uh, part of the original big team uh, who pulled the idea together uh, and have been the project director for, uh, for the last 18 months. Brilliant. Thank you. And Paul, your role within the project, please. Yeah, thank you. Good morning, Vicky, and good morning, Peter. Um, my name is Paul Gilligan. I'm the CEO of Pure Leapfrog. We are a decarbonisation and sustainability charity and our role in the 5G New Thinking project has been around helping to support the development of new business models, looking at the right kind of entities that communities may wish to choose to start up their new community enterprises, uh, looking at areas of uh, funding and finance and alternative forms of finance that might be available to, to communities undertaking this kind of project. Thank you, Paul. So let's dive straight in and uh, tackle some of the big topics within within this session. So obviously, any rural communities that are looking to um, deploy and operate their own mobile network are going to have a certain degree of uh, cost base involved in that. So what sort of funding and finance models are available to help rural communities to raise the capital that they need to be able to do that? And Paul, maybe I'll come to you first on that one, please. Sure. Um, OK, so, I mean, it's, it's, it's a big question and there's a complex tapestry of, of answers. Um, but in essence, when communities are looking to use some kind of alternative ownership vehicle to uh, fulfil a need that hasn't been met elsewhere, to take the, uh, the initiative to set up a project for themselves that will give them what they need, there can be various pots of funding that are available for them. Now we make a distinction between funding on the one hand and finance on the other. Mm. For us, funding is very much around grant funding um, and there are pots of money that communities will be able to apply to, such as national lottery grant making schemes, um, such as support from local authorities. Uh, there can be grants that are available from uh, some of the, 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 the philanthropic funders in the social impact space. So mm. uh, funders such as Esme Fairburn or um, the you know, Big Society Capital, the, these kinds of organisations can make grants, sometimes just to help something get off the ground. Maybe an initial feasibility study uh, to get some consultancy bought that the community is able to take advantage of and, and really uh, probe the question of, you know, is this something that we could do for ourselves? Mm. If so, what would we need to do and, and um, what might the impact be? You can get further rounds of funding. Uh, sometimes the same funder on seeing good results might come with follow through funding. Um, or sometimes if your project moves to a new stage where actually you're not looking so much at the, the, the early stage feasibility, but you need to start working up some, uh, some more detailed plans, then other funders may well step in at that point. Then if we look at finance, any, um, any undertaking, any trading always needs to be financed somehow. At the mm -hmm. very, very least, any entity that is trading is going to need working capital. Uh, and aside from that, what we're looking at here are um, communications solutions for communities. And that involves not only the working capital that will be needed to operate any business, but also probably quite significant amounts of capex to invest yeah. in the assets, in the infrastructure. And different types of finance can be available again to community enterprises that might not be available to privately owned businesses. And these can be uh, sources of capital that come with um, social impact goals attached. Mm -hmm. So the, the investor is still looking for a financial return, but they're also looking to ensure that their money is going to work for the support of social impact, communities, improving lives, etc. 
Brilliant, thank you. And Peter, bring, bringing you into the, into the conversation now as well. Um, it sounds like actually there are a, quite a large range of, of options available. What advice would you give to any communities who aren't really sure where to look first or, or how to find out what funding options and finance options are actually available to them? Well, I think, uh, so the, I mean, part of the point of our, of our toolkit is to help exactly that. Uh, and that type of community. Uh, what's really interesting about the way that rural connectivity has grown up in the UK is that there are pockets of places um, that have had community initiatives, uh, certainly on the fixed line uh, side, for for a number of number of years, um, you know, decades now at this point. Uh, so there is there are pockets of experience uh, about how to do this. Um, but what we've seen with five G is that there's different there's there's new new opportunities that that creates, new ways you can do this, mm-hmm. which is why the toolkit has come in, uh, we think is, is important to build now. Um, so uh, I think that's a, that's an that's important part. I think um, the, the the grant areas that, uh, uh, that, that Paul talks about, you know, there's, uh, there, there's, there's a lot of kind of structural support uh, for, for, for communities that, that there are, the agencies know how to access. And so if there are communities that have interest in you know, the the likes of the LEP and and, and others in, in those types of uh, those types of community uh, mm. business engagement roles, they know where the where those pockets are, and it's often about pulling together that kind of knowledge base locally uh, to to be able to make you know get yourself a, a, a good start on this. Brilliant, and as you say, putting together that knowledge base locally is really important. But would you say that actually, you know? reaching out to other communities that might not necessarily be rural, I suppose, but reaching out to other communities throughout the, the country to share those kind of learnings and, and to benefit from the, sort of the wisdom of those who kind of re- trodden this path before would, would be an important first step as well, would you say? I think so. And I think what's, what's, what's important about that is uh, that the, well, it's, it's necessary to learn from what others have done uh, mm-hmm. and, and may able to do. Um, there are going to be different models that that each that are going to fit with each locality. You know, yeah. often, the, the, although demographically we might be talking about areas of relative, relatively relatively similar, um, actually, you know, the, the the shape of a local area can be changed dramatically by the presence of a large employer uh, or a particular industry, uh, or so on and so forth. And so, actually. Uh, there's a need to, to factor that into to the planning, um, but certainly um, learning and indeed uh, capturing that learning again. Another reason why we think the toolkit is important, because we've seen that these these pockets develop and grow up um, in, in in some of these locations um, over the last you know, 10, 20 years. But how do you replicate that for every community? That's that's proven very difficult, um, and programmatic efforts to do that. Have also been very difficult. Um, mm. uh, you know, we're talking about places that where um, capital is available, but that's not the problem. It's, a, it's yes. an operational problem and a, and a finance and you know, a long-term sustainability problem. So, uh, so you know, top-down has been very difficult to achieve as well. So, what can we do to to pull together the learnings from from all of those different uh, different local actors um, and build that? up over time and that, that's that's why we're we're, we're making this talk brilliant thank you and Paul you alluded to it a little bit earlier um with investors potentially looking at, at, at social impact as well as kind of hard financial return but do you think that uh, rural communities do need to be thinking about a different investor mix when they're looking at securing finance routes I think it can be really helpful I mean it certainly what the local community is looking for is to bring forward a project that fulfills the need that they have and Mm. so at the end of the day I imagine that any local community would probably barring taking money from sources you really shouldn't be taking money from Mm. but a, a, a local community would probably ultimately be fairly agnostic as to where the capital comes from as long as um it's priced at such a level that means that the project is economically viable. Having said that, I think local communities that are looking at these kinds of projects have got really good stories to tell. Mm. And there's a really engaging and illuminating story around digital exclusion, around the impact on people's lives, around the impact on local economies, et cetera. And I think those stories can help reach 
some access to capital that wouldn't otherwise be available. Mm. And, uh, you know, th- th- this can include um, reaching out to your local community itself. So, for example, um, if, uh, if, a, if a community was to establish itself as a community benefit society, it is then able to issue what are called withdrawable community shares. And these aren't like normal shares in, in companies where you actually take a, a slice of equity in mm. the company. Um, they are, they're, they're, they're like loans, they're more like loans. Okay. And so you, you would price, you know, the Community Benefit Society would price the shares um, them, themselves and say each share is five pounds or each share is 50 pounds or, or whatever. Mm-hmm. And they would attach an interest rate to that. And they would go out to their community and say, look, who wants to invest in, in, yeah. in this project that is going to benefit us all? Um, and when, you know, when the community invests in those, they're able, they're able to take the money out at a later date, if they so wish, hence withdrawable. Mm-hmm. Um, and they will earn a coupon um, and they, they will earn interest on the, the money that they've put in. Um, you can also take this story and actually appeal to, say, your local authority or your local NHS trust, and you can say to them that our, our modelling, and there are frameworks that help you model this, for example, the government's Green Book, our modelling shows that there, might, you know, that there might very well be this kind of financial impact and lowering costs in the local authority area or lowering costs within the NHS trust. Mm. There might be the, these positive impacts and so actually, would you think about investing? If we're going to do this project and lower your costs, maybe you'd like to invest. Yeah. And, and you know, the, these are two examples of how the story can help you reach capital that might not otherwise be available. Absolutely. But also capital that is additional and different to that that I've already talked about okay. in terms of social impact investing. Yeah. And do you think that private sector could also play a role there as well? So we, we've talked already about how, you know, there could be one key um, employer in a, in a particular community. Do you think that there's also potential to, to reach out to um, a well-established rural industry, for example, that could also benefit from connectivity with the same sort of model? Yeah, for sure. I think you can approach all of these stakeholders. Um, if you have uh, some you know, a, a large local employer that is going to benefit from an improved connectivity then they're a key stakeholder Mm. and if they're already prominent in the community because they're a large local employer then they will already have worked out for themselves that (laughs) community relations and engagement with the local community is a really positive thing to do and it's not just box ticking a lot of these businesses genuinely feel um, a, a real obligation um, mm. to the communities that they operate in. Many of them, in our prior experience, are significant sized businesses, but actually still locally owned. And so the you know the, the same people live and work yes. in that local area yeah, who, are, yeah. who are the employers, and it really matters. So we've seen uh, you know we've seen a steel manufacturing um, business that is a local employer of some size. In a, in, in a Derbyshire Dales town that sponsors the local football team. It mm. makes perfect sense. Mm, so mm. That, that kind of local employer aspect is really important. And I think that any, any significant business in a rural area of this type would, would really want to have the conversation. Brilliant, thank you. Um, Peter, this idea of kind of community in investment, communities investing in, their, in the network that they themselves benefit from is, is a really interesting idea, I think. Are there any other sectors where we've seen that kind of approach work? So I think, um, well, two things. Tonight. First of all, I think we've seen in, in this sector, but not necessarily for 5G, but certainly in, in the fixed line um, 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 and broadband and kind of fixed wireless. Uh, we've seen communities doing that, uh, and quite often that's uh, you know, it, it's the support of uh, of local people saying, "Oh, you can put an aerial up on top of my top of my top of my church, or you can you know, someone's willing to dig a trench through their field, uh, and, and things like that that, that get uh, get those uh, get those things off the ground." Mm. Um, and actually, this, it, 
that's quite interesting as well uh, because you if you can harness kind of the local skill base and capability you actually do an awful lot to lower yes. your lower your cost um, and it's often why actually those networks can get built by the community they couldn't get built by private investors mm. by, by private telecoms networks because they'd have to pay someone to dig the trench uh, and they'd have to pay the land over the privilege and they'd have to pay rent on the church fire so yeah, that's a that's a that's a big you know, that's a big way that the community can can support itself in how it does this. Um, I think, um, but in terms of where we've seen uh, in, in other areas, um, I was um, uh, when we first built uh, this project, um, one of the uh, one of the initial um, one of the really interesting ideas that came through was from the renewable energy sector, um, which uh, uh, which had taken this type of this type of, of community financing model uh, and, and applied it to energy production uh, mm. and renewable energy production. Uh, and actually, I think, Paul, you, you had some direct experience with, uh, with that, if I'm right. Yeah, absolutely, Peter. We have had. Um, you know, one of the areas that LeapFrog is very active in is, is community energy. It's a, mm. a sector that you know, has its own name. It describes what it does. Um, and community energy is now quite a mature sector and it is exactly as you describe it's communities coming together to purchase generating assets mm. uh, that feed you know feed energy into uh, into the, the grid and um, that they're able to sell the energy that they uh, that they generate and it's all renewables so it's all you know focused on decarbonizing etc mm. um, and the, the community energy sector has has been doing this for a number of years now they had a head start because the, the government wanted to incentivize yes. the adoption of renewable technologies because of the broader drive to decarbonize. So there was something called the feed-in tariff that came into force a number of years ago. Um, it's no longer in force, but it did stimulate an awful lot of activity um, within communities to say, oh, well, you know, we, we, we can build a, 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 a small solar farm or we can purchase a wind turbine and, mm. and put it in this location. And they, they were able then to benefit from the, uh, from the subsidy that the government was paying uh, for, for, for generating that energy. So they sold the energy at a profit and mm -hmm. they picked up the subsidy as well. So, you know, it's, it's had a little bit of stimulation in the way in which uh, I think you know, remote telecoms hasn't, yeah. hasn't had. And so, you know, the, the analogy, if you like, starts to break down. But if you look at the idea of communities coming together, raise finance to buy assets to undertake projects that actually help that community it's it's a great example it's a great blueprint yeah it's re really really interesting it shows the level of kind of creativity and innovation that can exist in terms of getting these things funded and off the ground um question for both of you irrespective of, of what your investor mix looks like when you're doing something like building and operating a, a mobile network do you think that the you know, there is an obviously an inherent degree of, of cost in that. And Peter, you yourself acknowledged just then that actually it's, um, you know, the reason that the traditional um, infrastructure providers and operators haven't necessarily deployed in rural areas. Do you think that whatever investors you get on board need to accept that actually the durations for return are likely to be extended beyond, say, sort of normal or, or, or conventionally accepted parameters? So I think with um, uh, with with uh, with returns, I mean, I think where you, you know, one of the big challenges that that, that, that private industry and, and that, 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 that telecoms operators have in rural areas is that they do have a, a model that has to apply to the assets they deploy, regardless of whether that's in urban or rural areas. Mm. Um, and uh, uh, you know, and, and often that's about. You know, Proposition density, uh, digital adoption, and, and so on and so forth, um, uh, and so those are the metrics that guide um, uh, the guide the, the business case. And then you know, there is an expected return over a set number of years, and they have to amortise the cost of the spectrum licences and everything else that they build. So there's there is a there, you know, there's, there's a set model and you know, there's a bit of a little bit around the edge, but they change. But, but fundamentally, that has been rural activities problem for uh, since the dawn of time mm. um, now I think where um, uh, where rural uh, come in is, 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 is well where rural needs to think differently is 
yes, it's about the, the I think there's an element about the, the duration of, of the return. You have to build in the technology cycles and, and everything like that. Um, and, and, you know, uh, and so on. But, but actually you can, you can do that um, and you can, you can build out and design your, your, your networks in such a way as to, as to cater for that. Um, I think the, uh, but what this, what this does is allow you to look at how you generate different types of return. You know, we've talked about the, the social value side of, uh, of the return. Um, you know, we've, we've done some modeling in that, which I know we're going to talk about, we'll, we'll talk about in, a, in a separate conversation, um, where actually, you know, the, the, the social return is, is significant, but obviously that takes time to, to, to realize. Uh, and things like learning and, and education, uh, where you know, the access to, to a digital skill is, is tremendously impactful. Mm. Um, uh, and so, uh, actually, seeing how that play out over a, over a longer period uh, is is important for how the value gets returned from the from the network to to the community. Brilliant, thank you, Paul. Anything that you wanted to add into that from from your own experiences as well? You, you know, you talk specifically around um, investors that are motivated by social impact. Would they be expecting to look at, at kind of longer periods for for return? In our experience, uh, you you have to take each project on its own merits, I think. Mm -hmm. And undoubtedly, when you're looking at um, financing huge amounts of assets and building out large infrastructure projects, uh, these are going to be expensive. And I think what what is much more of a concern to investors is the security of their return rather the rather than the length of time okay. over which it, they, they, they can expect it. Um, you know, capital deployed is meant to generate a return. That's mm-hmm. <laughs> effectively it's the nature of it. how yeah. it is, it's <laughs> the nature of it. And if you, if you show an investor a financial model um, that, that, that gives them a, a return, you know, simple payback in like four years, and you're asking for, um, an investment of twelve million pounds for for this kind of infrastructure, um, then they might question the assumptions, mm. and they will look deeply at the assumptions, and mm. they're not going to be impressed. Uh, oh, we get my, our money back in four years if actually the assumptions that that's based on look really shaky. If you tell them that they're going to make um, a return of like, you know eight eight percent nine percent over a 15 year period or a 20 year period, investors can be incredibly happy with that. that that's, mm. that's not a problem. What they really care about is what, what are the risks in the financial modeling and in the business model? Um, do we think this stacks up? Are we being given assumptions that are well evidenced? Mm. Are those assumptions being built into a robust financial model? Um, and are we happy with the level of return that it shows us? And if all, all of those can be answered yes, yes, and, and yes, then I think the, the length of time over which you recoup your investment is less of a concern, but there might be different investors who, you know, who, who have different, different investment aims mm. and goals mm. um, and who might pass up an opportunity that is incre- incredibly solid because they don't want a 20 year yeah. um, opportunity that locks up their capital for, for that long. Um, and so, you know, they'll, they'll say, well, thank you. And it's great, but move along, please. And by the way, here's a business card of somebody you might want to talk to. Mm, mm. Brilliant. No, that's a, that's a really helpful perspective. Thank you. Um, so I'm going to come to each of you now and, and, and ask for your kind of final words of wisdom. So that the one sort of top tip or, or takeaway that you would like anyone watching this, this um, recording to take away regarding funding and finance. Um, and Peter, I'll come to you first on that, please. Yeah, I think, um, well, just something we haven't touched on, um, uh, actually, is, is, I think is worth, uh, worth, worth noting. Um, which is the role of um, the role of local uh, local providers um, mm-hmm. uh, as well. Uh, so when we've been looking at the um, at the business case um, for for this, and I know we'll, we'll, there's 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 other uh, uh, other areas where people can dive into this more. Um, but the the way that the business case stacks up 
it needs to look at community need in, in the round. Um, and so there will be some local providers uh, that, are, that, are, that, are, that are out there in the community that are doing uh, less or more. Um, they have a really important role as kind of the local, uh, the local skill base, the local knowledge base for, for what demand currently looks like and the skill base to be able to help uh, communities use that. Uh, and I think you, know, you, you have to look at how we pull together all of the skills uh, in the in a community to, mm. to make it work, and that includes looking at uh, the, the 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 skills they have around uh, uh, around funding and finance as well, um, you know, where you've got um, people who have that uh, have that knowledge and, and understand how the uh, how those how those businesses operate, you know, telecom operates, telecom businesses operate. Uh, you know, that they're going to have a very solid understanding of of what's achievable uh, for the community, uh, and I think that's a uh, that's an important area for um, for, for communities to, to, to make use of. Yeah, brilliant. Thank you, Peter. And uh, Paul, coming to you, please. So I think my top takeaway for communities in this respect when talking about funding and finance is diversify your sources of funding as far as possible. Mm -hmm. um, look at every opportunity. Look at every case you can make. Mm -hmm. Who Who's... Who stands to gain out of what you're proposing? Knock on their doors and you know, <laughs> shake the tin. Um, you know, this is a community effort. You don't want to be designing something that is forever reliant on grant funding yes. um, and never actually um, never brings forward a sustainable business model. Mm. Um, and you don't want to be stuck in the development phase for too long because the aim is to, to bring something to your community. But there's a lot of ground to cover mm -hmm. and there will be a lot of stakeholders that you can identify. And so there'll be a lot of doors that you can knock on and really leverage the amount of funding that you can get to carry you as far as you possibly can because that can help bring down the cost of the project overall at the end of the day. Then when you're looking at finance, I would say get in touch with experts. If you've got them in your community, that's fantastic. Uh, if you need to contact other organizations um, that have got these skills, then do so. But you really then need to look at financial models and what your assumptions are based on and really start working up um, a, a good model that you can present to investors. Brilliant. Thank you. Uh, Paul, Peter, thank you very much for your time today. Um, for those of you watching, if you haven't already, I would encourage you strongly to look at the finance and funding section of the toolkit and indeed the toolkit more broadly. It's full of really useful content written by individuals such as Peter and Paul, who've been there, done that um, and kind of sharing all of their uh, expertise and experience with you. Thank you very much for watching. <laughs>